Good morning, everybody. If you didn't pick up the Lenten, the rest of the Lenten devotions, there are some at the back there. I know last week there were a bunch of people not here. And, but, so if you didn't pick up one of these, you can pick them up and encourage you to continue with the Lenten devotions. How's it going with those of you who are doing it? Stunning. Oh, good. <laughs> if you have your Bible, uh, turn with, oh, by the way, Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday. At the end of the service, we are having a water baptism. And if you have not been water baptized, uh, please let us know so that we can prepare for you to be water baptized on Easter Sunday. And it's a wonderful time of celebration. And I promise you, the baptism will be warm. I remember one time we were doing a water baptism and they'd heated the water up so much that everybody came out parboiled. <laughs> they were so hot. <laughs> I mean, everybody was pink when they came out. Another time they didn't warm it up at all and everybody was the frozen chosen. So it would be just right this time. And we have some wonderful young ladies who want to get baptized. About this big. Simone, how old is Simone? She's eight. And she asked her mother to bring her to church so she could get water baptized. Isn't that amazing? And her cousin heard about it, and her cousin also wants to be water baptized the same day. So I think it's absolutely marvelous. So turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew 17. From verse 14 to 20 and it would be helpful if you could also look at Mark 9 Mark 9 verses 14 to 29 and uh, so we're gonna flip backwards and forwards between these two passages Mark 9 verse 14 to 29 and Matthew 17 verse 14 to 20 I let me start by telling you a story can't imagine what it must have been felt like for a newly married couple. They'd been married for two years and were on honeymoon in Hawaii. They were body surfing off the coast of Ohio when a particularly violent wave drove him headfirst into the sand, jarring him violently and injuring him in a way that must have been terrifying for both of them. He was paralyzed and unable to move, unable to feel anything. His weeping bride was stunned, wondering if she would have to deal with a quadriplegic for the rest of their married lives. Laying there in a hospital, their future must have looked bleak. Thankfully, he just suffered a temporary shock to his spinal column, and within days, he would recover all his functions and lead a perfectly normal life. If truth be known, most of us would admit that we walk a fine line between believing and not believing. There are times in our lives when we, when yes, it seems that uh, we believe all things we say about God, we read the Bible and we worship, and then there are times we feel so close to Him. But there are also the desert times in our lives when we wonder whether we believe anything anymore. God, Jesus, the church, discipleship, and it's especially true with miracles, isn't it? The problem with miracles is they don't seem to happen anymore. So we're not sure if we believe in them even. So sometimes we, we joke about miracles in the Bible. I read a story of three preachers once out fishing, and two of them walked to the shore on the water while the third tried, and he, sure enough, he sinks. And one of the two says to the other, do you think we should tell him where the rocks are? Yeah. What about the one where the boy came home from church and his mother asked him what he learned in Sunday school? And so he told her about Moses leading Israeli troops using the latest surface-to-air missiles against the Egyptians. And she said, are you telling me the truth? And he said, no, but if I told you what the teacher said that had happened, you wouldn't believe me. 
The bottom line is, many times we don't know what to do with miracles, whether we need to believe them or not. Or when we try and explain them, what we do is often try and put them within our own worldview. Some scholars say the waters didn't really part uh, in true Cecil B. DeMille fashion, but the wind blew over the shallow, shallow reed seat. See, sorry, the wind blew on the shadow, shallow reed sea as it often does, and the waters moved a little, and the Israelites were able to walk across. I think about this young man's paralysis, that feeling of helplessness, and I believe it's a picture of us in our sin apart from Christ a picture of absolute powerlessness. We know that there's different kinds of power, political, military, physical, electrical, nuclear, economic, power of the media, and so on. Power is the ability to change and influence the world. And people like to see themselves as powerful and able to make a difference. But you know, the Bible portrays us as spiritually powerless apart from Christ. We are powerless to change our nature and our hearts. We are powerless to throw off the demonic oppression of Satan's kingdom and its opposition to us. The bottom line is we need a savior. We need a savior and that's why Jesus Christ came. We heard the testimony of that precious young lady this morning it was only through Christ that she got any relief from those demonic things that affected her. Only Jesus Christ can bring freedom to all. Romans 5 and 6 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Ungodly. Who's that? That's you and I. That was you and me. We were the ungodly, but Christ died for us and reconciled us to our Heavenly Father. In today's passage, we see Christ again coming face to face with the powerlessness of a father and a demon-possessed boy. But we also see the disciples' powerlessness who through their lack of faith seem unable to do anything about it. And in the end, we see the powerlessness of the demon to oppose Jesus. We see the powerlessness of darkness to resist the light and the powerlessness of unbelief to resist the faith given us even today. Demons have to flee at the name of Christ. Final lesson of this passage is this. If you believe in Jesus Christ, then nothing is impossible for you. Let me say that again. If you believe in Jesus Christ, then nothing is impossible for you. This encounter with Christ is a timeless testimony to the power of faith to overcome our powerlessness. He has the context. Jesus and three of his chosen disciples are coming from the mountaintop and into the valley. It comes to all of us. We can't live on the mountaintops all the time we will at times have to come down to the valley. And so they descending from the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus was transfigured, where they saw Moses and Elijah as well. And they descend into the Valley of Humiliation. Now let me explain. According to Mark's gospel, Jesus' enemies were there attacking the nine uh, disciples that Jesus had left down in the valley. Mark 9, 14 says, And when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Now, place yourself in that position. Place yourself in that context, in that scene, and think about it. You have these nine disciples, and they've got the teachers of the law um, around them, accusing them of not being... Uh, faithful of not having Christ, of not being able to do anything. And then Matthew 17, verse 14. And when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. So yeah, we have the nine, the crowd, the Pharisees, the, uh, the scribes, etc. We have them. 
And here comes Jesus with the three disciples. And a man comes up to him and approaches Jesus and knelt before him and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You see, this was all a setup to discredit Jesus. The love of a father is amongst the strongest in the world. Three things caused the father's anguish. Firstly, the son was his only child. Secondly, the son was in agony and his life threatened every day. And thirdly, as a father, he was utterly powerless. He did not know what to do. He must have heard of Jesus' reputation as a healer, but now perhaps that reputation had been damaged by his disciples' failure to drive out the demon. The son's condition in the original language is described as lunatic. It's also in the King James Version, which is related to the Greek word for the goddess of the moon. They believed that epileptic seizures were brought on because they had, in some sense, offended the moon goddess. The seizures would wax and wane with the moon's patterns, and that's uh, what the word lunatic means. This man, however, however, rightly believed that the demons had brought this on. Mark 9, verse 17, teacher, I have brought you my son possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him on the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I can't imagine what an epileptic seizure would be like. But I've seen a few people who've had them. And there, there have been some whose children have suffered through them. Perhaps you have that kind of issue and only can imagine how terrifying it must be to go through that trauma. But even worse, the demon isn't merely robbing his son of speech. The demon is trying to kill him. Jesus said, Satan is a murderer and a murderer from the beginning. And he does it here by bringing on convulsions, resulting the boy in throwing himself often into the fire, it says, or the water. Imagine being this boy's father, never knowing at what moment a seizure would, could come on, and it might be this boy's last. And it's been going on since childhood. Matthew 17 from verse 14, a man approached Jesus, knelt before him, and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. Now, he bows down before Christ, as before a king, and he calls him Lord. You know, this was common in those days, and it didn't mean that he understood who Jesus was, but he understood that Jesus had great power. However, as I said earlier, his faith was somewhat damaged, Mark 9, 22 to 23. If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Jesus ans answered this way. He said, if you can, all things are possible to those who believe. So he says, if I can, let me tell you, all things are possible to those who believe. Herein lies the rub. Can Jesus do anything about the situation you find yourself in today? We say, if you can do anything, Jesus, please do something, some little thing to show me that you're there. But all things are possible to those who believe. And he then says, I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. The disciples were stripped, exposed, and weak. Even though they had previously been given power over the demons to drive them out. Mark 3 Jesus appointed 12 and designated them apostles that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach the gospel and to have authority to drive out demons. So when Jesus called these guys, he gave them the authority 
to drive out the demons. We don't know what they did, but it seems, if you read the text, that they didn't pray. After all, they came to Jesus afterwards privately and said, why couldn't we drive them out? And Jesus answers, and this is the clue, Jesus answers and said, this kind can only come out by prayer. Think about it. A demon-possessed boy, and they don't even pray? Instead of calling on Almighty God, maybe they tried the same technique they had developed on an earlier mission trip. Because it says in Luke 10, 17, they returned back full of joy saying, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And now this time, they couldn't do anything. You see, the root issue here is unbelief. Matthew says, why couldn't we drive them out? Jesus answered and said, because you have so little faith. The bottom line is this. They fail to trust in God's power working through them. In fact, with Jesus away, they probably felt alone and they felt they couldn't do it. They needed to rely on Almighty God, His invisible working power, whether Jesus was physically there or not. And folks, that's what we need to be relying on in every circumstance that confronts us. Instead, they relied on themselves. I don't know what the demon said or did, but we know in the book of Acts that a demon beat up some people who were unqualified to drive out the seven sons of Sceva. Jesus comes down from the mountain and the father encounters him. Jesus responds to everybody. He says, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long must I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Perverse means, he's in fact saying, all of you guys out there, all of you are perverse. You've gone off the right path. The standard is absolute perfection. And we are an unbelieving and perverse generation, and we stand well rebuked by Jesus here. I believe all sin is a failure of faith. Hmm. Let me say that again. I believe all sin is a failure of faith. Let that just sink in for a moment. And then comes that beautiful statement, bring the boy here. There's nothing he cannot do. Whatever it is, bring everything to Jesus. Matthew 17, 18, Jesus rebuked the demon. He came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. To his enemies, perhaps to the desperate father, or even to the disciples, he was just an ordinary man. And so the encounter with the desperate father makes sense. Mark 9, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us, if you can. And Jesus says effectively, do you know who you're talking to? And so Christ reveals his power again. There is no one here today who pro properly esteems the power of Jesus Christ. We all underestimate what he can do. We all underestimate what he can do. We all in effect saying, if you can do anything, could you help me? But all things are possible to those who believe. When Jesus saw a crowd running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. Deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsing him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. And so the demon recoils in terror and abject hatred and gives the boy one final kick before he leaves him. He must obey because all authority in heaven and earth is Jesus's. Remember this, that today 
all of the people, you've got to remember this, that all of the people that Jesus healed in those days are now dead. Their bodies have long since turned to dust. Remember also that Jesus' miracles are signs pointing to him. They're signs of a future reality where there'll be no more demon possession, no disease, no mourning, no crying, no pain, no death. It'll all be gone. He will heal the world through faith in his name and the new heaven and the new earth will be called the home of the righteous. The miracles are a symbol, a sign of a coming reality. Let me explain, 1 Corinthians 15. And so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is, is, perishable, is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. That's who you are. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So who is that last Adam? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Jesus has come to give you eternal life not merely to heal you. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become God's righteousness. Trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins and you will live forever. You will have a resurrection body and there will come a time when you won't know any disease or pain and death will be a thing of the past. Trust in him. That's the healing work he wants to do in you. You see, let me explain it this way. If I get healed today, I'm still going to die. But if I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I will be spending eternity with him. That's what it's all about, folks. That's why he came, to reconcile man to God, he became the bridge for us between our sinful past and our heavenly future. Trust in him. The account ends with the issue of faith, the primacy of faith. Look at Matthew 17, verse 90 to 20. The disciples came to Jesus in private. Why would they do that? Well, they'd been shown up. They were embarrassed maybe. Jesus, we couldn't do, we couldn't drive that demon out. What did we do wrong? Maybe they said. We have to go back to the technique school again. Exorcism 101 didn't work. We need exorcism 201. We need advanced exorcism. What did we do wrong? Why couldn't we drive the demon out? And so what does Jesus say to them? Because you have so little faith. I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing is impossible for you. Jesus' miracle of healing and feeding were not proof of God's kingdom, but signs of it. And as such, only faith recognizes them as acts of God, because miracles don't prompt faith. Faith helps us see miracles. Remember one time we were in Nepal, and uh, we had a great deal of opposition come against us because we were in this nation, and we were right on the, the border near China. And during the day, we had leadership meetings. We had over 800 leaders from all around the area. Some we're on a bus for a week to get to the meetings. We fed them. We ministered to them during the day. In the evening, we had crusades in the town. And we had up to 12,000 people at these crusades. And the most amazing thing is, after the first night, the very next day, in their local newspaper, somebody explained what the newspaper said, 
they were warned, people were warned not to go to that crusade. Can you imagine what that did? People came in their droves. And I'm not saying this to boast in any way whatsoever. But we believe God that God was going to do miracles with the people. That they were going to bring the sick, the lame, the halt, the maimed, and the blind. And we saw miracle after miracle after miracle happen. And you know what that did? That built the faith in the people that were there. When the first miracle happened, and we're talking about 12,000 people who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. When that first miracle happened, and I, I, if I remember correctly, it was somebody's ears opened. They'd been deaf from birth. And God opened that person's ears. You know when you go like this? She could hear. Guess what that did to the rest of the crowd? It built up their faith to believe that Jesus is who he said he is. I could tell you more things. Another time we were in Soweto and we had an evangelist, dear man and his wife, Bill and Jenny Grine. And we were in a stadium there. We put on this crusade. We are in a stadium. And yeah... A young man, grandson, brings his grandmother in a wheelbarrow because they didn't have money. They didn't have the resources to buy her a wheelchair. They brought her, this young man brought her in a wheelbarrow. And again, we believe God for miracles because that is what I call the dinner bell. People get their faith rises and they give their hearts to Christ. Bill Grind was a big man. I mean, he was a huge man. He, had, he used to wear a 58 long jacket. So you can imagine how large he was. Maybe like one of your brothers. <laughs> and, and, God, and this guy took this old lady by the hands and he just picked her up out of the wheelbarrow. And he put her on the ground. You know, put her feet on the ground, and she wobbled and didn't do anything. And he said, in the name of Jesus, and we're standing around praying over this little old lady, and the next thing, she starts walking. Hadn't walked for years. She starts walking. And then she takes his hand on one side, and I can't remember who was on the other side, took the other person's hand, and she starts running up and down like this. What did that do? The miracle working power of God raised that woman out of that stupid old wheelbarrow and she started walking and she walked off. I could tell you stories like this. Sometimes I'm, I'm praying and thinking about a service and God just brings this stuff back to me as an encouragement to me because God is not finished with us yet. Amen? All right. Problem so many have with miracles today is that we think they prove something. But what do miracles really prove? Nothing. A thousand miracles would neither prove or disprove Jesus' teachings. Miracles can neither make true teachings false nor false teachings true. Jesus understood this, and that's why he downplayed miracles. You see, God is not some divine magician ready to pull rabbits out of every hat when we offer up prayers. Only faith, only in faith do we even recognize them all. And how do real miracles come to us? Only when all seems lost and the limits of our human resources are being reached and passed. When all hope seems gone, and there's nothing left but God. Problem with us in the Western world is we so easily turn to other things before we turn to God. And God oftentimes becomes the last resort.
And so, the true lesson here is overcoming unbelief. The great enemy is not the disease of demon possession. It's a far greater enemy than that. All physical diseases cannot condemn your soul to an eternity in hell. But unbelief can. To not believe in Jesus is a sin perishable by death. He said, why did you doubt? Thomas, you know, after the resurrection... He heard of the account from the other apostles that Jesus had been risen from the dead. But he said, and this is what Thomas said, I tell you what, unless I put my finger in his hand where the nail marks were and put my hand on the side of him, I will not believe it. And so a week later, Jesus gave him what he asked for. The doors were locked in fear of the Jews, and Jesus came and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And he walked straight to Thomas and says, Okay, look, look and see. My hands, my side, stop doubting and believe. And believe. And Thomas said, My Lord and my God. Jesus said, Because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And isn't that you and I today? We are blessed because we have not seen and yet believe. You've not seen, yet you believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. He who raised Jesus from the dead, can he not take care of your problem today? Whatever that problem that you hold in the air with you today, can he not take care of that problem? We'll trust him for resurrection. We'll trust him for the by and by. But do we trust him for the here and now? For our finances, if we're in financial difficulty. For our healing, if we have physical issues. Whatever it may be, can you trust Jesus today? So what do we mean by faith? Well, faith can grow. 2 Thessalonians 1 and 3 says, Your faith is growing increasingly. Well then, what is the issue with the mustard seed? They said, increase our faith. And he said, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there. So faith can grow. It's not a matter of size or amount. It's a matter of getting out of the way and letting the almighty God do what he wants. It's not faith that moves the mountain. It's God that moves it, but we have faith in him. And he does it by people who believe in him. And as you know, there's all kind of aberrations of the faith teaching today. The name and claim it thing. If you have enough faith, you can do anything and have anything. But that's a reverse of our relationship with God, where he becomes your servant and you become the king deciding what's best for the universe. What then is faith? Making God do what we want? Not at all. No, but I will trust him. And he will do whatever he thinks is best for me. That's what faith is. Let me close with a true story. We know that miracles happen in unexplainable occurrences. So a 19-year-old young girl, Kumpaut, recounts a narrow escape from the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia after an arduous journey with 100 other refugees uh, through miles of jungle, canals, mountains, and river. Between them and freedom were communist troops and a stretch of jungle covered with thorns. At midnight, the little party crossed a valley between two high mountain ranges, we could see absolutely nothing, she said. We couldn't even see where to step. Then suddenly scores of fireflies swarmed into view, and by the glow of the firefly light, they made their way to the next mountain. 
the Kamput refugee camp, Kumpaut was invited to a Christian meeting. Now listen to this. When she came in, she pointed to a picture on the chapel wall. I know that old man, she said. He is the one that led us to freedom. She'd never seen it before. It was a picture of Jesus Christ. I don't know how those things happen, but I do know that they do. Only, and only the eyes of faith can see them. I don't know if the waters passed parted for Moses the way it did for Charlton Heston or exactly what happened in that boat with the disciples on that day. But I tell you this, you will never convince them that God wasn't there. Whatever happens, God intervenes and saves them. And it happens today in our world, in our time. I know it's not easy to believe in miracles in our time. The problem with them is that we think they don't happen. The problem is they do happen. We've had miracle after miracle happen in this church. People have prayed and people have been miraculously healed and set free. The question is, do we have enough faith to see them and experience God's power and presence in, their li in our lives? Do you have enough faith for that? Only you can answer the question for yourself. So let's close in prayer. The problem is, as I said, do we have enough faith to see them and experience God's power and presence in our lives? Only you can answer that question. And so we say this morning, Father, help my unbelief. Whatever area we're facing in our lives, Help our unbelief. Help us to trust you explicitly. I thank you, Lord, for the prayer that was spoken by Gabby over people today who are lonely, who feel let down, who feel like they've been abandoned. Help our unbelief. In Jesus' name I pray. Father, I thank you for the word this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you've revealed yourself to us in an amazing way. Lord, I believe you for miracles today in people's lives. Father, I believe you for a miracle in my own life a healing miracle in my own life. I believe you for that, Lord. But I do thank you that because of our belief in you, we have been reconciled to you and whatever happens here on earth, we know what eternity holds for us. That one day we might be absent from the body, but we will be present with you. And we rejoice in that day. And everybody said, Amen. another story of this bull grind. You can go and look him up online. 58 long jacket. So he's speaking one day in the church. And now, there are not too many 58 long 
people who wear 58 long jackets. So he's preaching one day and he says, the Lord just told me that I need to give my jacket away. And it was this beautiful cashmere coat that he had. And he says, there is somebody here who this jacket is going to fit perfectly. And there from right at the back of the church, somebody walks down and says, thank you for my jacket. So he takes, Bill takes off the jacket and he gives this guy this jacket and it fitted absolutely perfectly. That's what our God can do, folks. So here's the question. Do you believe that God can do these things even today? That's the key. If you get anything out of this message, that's the key. Do you believe that our God is still in the miracle working business? I do. And even if He doesn't heal my body, I know that one day I'm going to be in His presence and I will have a healed body. I can't dictate to Him what He needs to do for me, but I can do this, is believe that I'm going to be spending eternity with Him. So that's the question. Can you accept that Jesus Christ died for you so that you may spend eternity with Him? What a day that will be to spend eternity with Him and all the pain, all the travail, all the stuff from this world will be gone. Bless these precious people, Lord, in Jesus' name. Bless them abundantly. May each one of us know the reality of your Christianity is not something we just do on a Sunday. But it's a day-by-day exploration with you of our faith. Every single day, it is knowing you better. It is walking as you've called for us to walk. And living as you've called for us to live. So that we might be a testimony to your grace and your love and your power. Father, give us a heart of compassion. You heard that last week. With the feeding of the 4,000, when he turned to his disciples and he says, I have compassion on these people. They've been with me three days. We can't just send them away. And you know, Peter couldn't pick up the phone and just call McDonald's and say, I want 4,000 meals to go. It had to be a miracle. Father, may we have your compassion for our friends, our neighbors, for those that are within our circle of influence. Father, I pray that we have that compassion see people as you see them. In Jesus' name I pray. I want you to think of one person. One person. Not two, not five, not fifty. One person. And I want you to pray for them right now. Just pray for that one person now. That this Easter they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. in this country it's so easy to believe because we're not persecuted but you know what it's also so easy to not believe because we're not challenged and I think of that young 19 year old girl in Cambodia just for a moment think of what she had to go through with those hundred people there God just manifests fireflies that leads them on the way 
and she walks into a chapel and she recognizes that it was Jesus Christ who led her and that group through to safety. So as I said, it's easy to believe, but it's also easy not to believe in this country. We can just kind of live our lives like we want to, but I pray God would stir within you and me the urgency of the day. I read an article yesterday that there is an epidemic of loneliness going on in our nation. An epidemic of loneliness. You and I have the answer to that through Jesus Christ. Could it be that you have a grandmother sitting in an old age home somewhere and you kind of forget about her and every few months you might pick up the phone? Could we have a brother who's an alcoholic ever asked why he's doing what he's doing? Could it be a sister who grace joy for her is come three o'clock in the afternoon or four o'clock in the afternoon she breaks open a bottle of wine because she's lonely even in a marriage she's lonely I don't know what it is we have the answer to that loneliness. God created a community. He created the body of Christ for you and I so that we might be in communion with one another. So we know of one person we've prayed for. There's a second thing I encourage you to do today. Call somebody from this church this week and tell them you're praying for them. I could rattle off 20 names without, just from the top of my head, of people who are missing. I don't know why, but maybe they need you to pick up the phone and say, hey, I miss you. I miss you. I need you in my life. Amen. I know I've preached the second sermon, but here we go. tell you, you go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God has put you there. He has a purpose in you being there. Christ who indwells you is something He wants to do through you wherever you are. The Holy Spirit who guides and leads you will show you things to come. Be open to His leading today. Believe this go in his grace and love and power in the name of him him who is the way the truth and the life Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and everybody said Amen